Today we welcome Catherine Zakoyan to the GDC. Catherine is a child and family therapist in the Boulder and Vail communities who specializes in the needs of the profoundly gifted. Among many other specialties, Catherine is also an educational and organizational development consultant and an early childhood health, mental health expert. She also founded an art workshop experience company called Kinship Art. Catherine, thank you so much for being here with us today. Sure, Kim. Thank you Glad so to much. Be here. Good. Well, we're going to get started. Okay. Can you share with us a little bit about what you're doing, your work, and the things you do with gifted children? Oh, sure. Um, so I'm in private practice as a counselor, and I offer um, individual child counseling services and also family counseling services. And um, I was trained by, well, I have excellent training, both through the University of Colorado at um, at Denver and my mentors there, but also um, did some specialty training as a Gestalt play therapist with a theorist named Violet Oaklander. So I offer up um, an experiential model for children, which gives them opportunities to explore and express who they are and who they're not, and what's important to them and what's not, and in that process, um, strengthen their sense of self and um, sort through the parts of themselves that serve them and the parts of themselves that give them trouble and try to integrate those so that they can move forward, um, crafting out the life they wish for themselves. What is, what's the age range of kids that you work with? Oh, great question. So I work with um, children as, as young as about three. And, oh, that's amazing. Yeah, all the way through um, you know, high school, college age ranges, typical range age ranges, plus I work with young adults and, and adults, couples, and families. Okay. Yeah. What do you notice just as in the field of gifted? What are people coming to you? The most? What are the, the biggest oh, needs that you're seeing? That's a great question. Um, often it's my experience that families find their way to me because their child is um, experiencing some distress in the world. And sometimes if they're in a school setting, it's happening at school for them where they're just not feeling comfortable um, in school or they're having difficulties with their social life at school or their emotional life at school. Sometimes it's within the family um, where a child is just struggling to sort of find their way, mm -hmm. um, and struggling to find their way in the world, and um, often linked to just the nature of being gifted, you know, natural um, adjustments to life. Sure, and all the asynchronous development doesn't and make that any easier, does it? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> well, what other, other work do you offer the world? See, I, um, <clears throat> I teach a bit. I teach um, some college-level psychology and counseling coursework once in a while. I um, love to give presentations and trainings for um, schools and um, larger gifted groups and organizations that want to bring in a speaker. Um, probably my, um, the, the most work I do beyond counseling would be in the realm of educational consultation where I go into a school setting and I help them sort through what they wish for themselves, um, what's working, what's not working, and um, create a plan to help them get to those places. Are those usually public schools or private schools? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, right, uh, usually they're, they're more in the private realm or they are somehow contract schools with a public school district that have a little more um, uh, freedom to mm -hmm. kind of go out and kind of be a little more creative. And I say that with all honor to public school systems, but often they're, they have kind of a protocol that they need to follow. So I'm more in like, um, specialty programs that are serving like at-risk teens, for example, or um, an early childhood setting that has kind of a specialty um, population. So um, one of my main components of my work that, that's really become part of my life work and what I'm really passionate about is helping educators become more self-aware and um, take better care of themselves mm -hmm. and working with leadership to help them develop their leadership um, skills, both the technical skills of human resources management, for example, but also their own personal leadership vision. And those two components, um, over and over again, I find if those are in places in place, schools are really able to set a social emotional container for the, the students they serve and they can really move forward and do some really amazing things including grow in the ways they want to. Um, I so often find in my experience um, educators are so kind-hearted and they they come to the field because it's it's light and it's it's of service mm -hmm. to the world and they want to work with children but um, 
those of us who work with children, you know, we come to a place where we realize, or somebody helps us realize that partly why we come to work with children often is because we hold a bit of woundedness ourselves mm -hmm. um, from our school experiences or from other childhood experiences. And I think when you work with children, when you work with any humans, you have to become so self-reflective <laughs> so it doesn't get tangled up in, in, in what you're trying to offer and how you're trying to help. So I love helping educators get to those places where they can self-reflect. And, and teachers don't have a lot of places to self -ref or to reflect or get reflection. They don't have a lot of mentoring. Some do. It depends on sort of your cohort, where you went to school, and how your organization's set up. But I help schools set that up so that they can become very aware that when something's not working at school, it's really a systemic thing that they need to be looking at. It's not just the one child. It's that child's like the bellwether for, for something that could be helpful for everybody to look at. Does that make sense? Absolutely. You know, I teach part-time back in Nebraska, and I can just see your services being so beneficial. The, these are things that people don't even... Teachers are so busy covering the curriculum, making sure kids are ready for assessments. This other part yeah. of it isn't even... I know. I don't even think it crosses their mind. Yeah, I, I agree, and I, I feel like there's been so much um, well-intended sort of pressure to, to help schools improve, but it's taken away some of the time that teachers would have to be creative or perhaps, or, or self-reflective, mm -hmm. or create collegial um, circles um, in some ways to kind of elevate their profession. It, it, so I, I love, and I say that with a lot of respect, um, but I, I love being able to come in and help them find ways. Well, it sounds like that. you're looking at the teachers the same way you look at children as a whole mm -hmm. yeah. person. Right. Yeah. Right. And then in all, almost all my consultation work, I end up um, also being, um, if they don't already have sort of a gifted um, perspective, if it's a population that doesn't, um, hasn't looked at that before, I end up sort of weaving that in too, because inevitably, um, <laughs> more times than not, the children that are the most challenging who bring the school sort of to their to their knees to decide how, how are we going to work, how are we going to move forward, um, those kids often hold some component or facet of giftedness and uh, it's been unidentified or, or maybe even marginalized and helping sure. to frame that and helping schools um, support. These are some <laughs> great things for <laughs> schools to think about. So how did you find your way to this? Uh, uh, so I, I, I was an art student in college and I took some business courses. I went to a really wonderful liberal arts college that allowed me to design my own work. And um, after that, worked for an entrepreneur in Chicago and um, then eventually moved, to Chicago, uh, moved from Chicago to Colorado and continued to work for <clears throat> really interesting, successful, almost iconic businesses that um, were owned by entrepreneurs and just got some great experience and exposure to um, creative business and kind of bringing things to the next level and um, sort of simultaneously I found myself in roles that had to do with human resources and um, uh, I did a lot of uh, work in uh, production management for a creative uh, company and just ended up being a kind of weaving those things together and just become, becoming very, very interested in psychology as it showed up in business, and especially for creative professionals. So how, um, two things, one, how we're in a workplace and a work circle together, how we all work together, and um, two, what, when you, what do you do when you're a creative professional, when you have a patron or patroness, and um, yet you have your own vision, and, and how, you <clears throat> how you hold true to yourself. And so I got very interested in um, those dynamics and then when I was in human resources management, I started to notice that people would have the same dilemma over and over again. Um, even if people changed or their depart they changed departments or even they they would just have the same, same difficulty. And I really got curious about that and decided to go back to school to become a counselor, did some research and uh, found my way and was planning to actually work with creative professionals. That was my vision. And then I took a class in counseling children and families. I had a wonderful mentor, professor in the class, who taught the class, uh, Kathy Hagberg. And, um, through that experience, realized that I had a skill set that really matched up well with working with children and working with families. And then had another um, just sort of stretch of great experience in my internship doing in-home family therapy with at-risk families, and um, it was wonderful. And I just it just opened this whole path. And, and if you had told me when I started school that that's where I'd end up, mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure I would have would have believed you, but 
it really makes sense and it's a great it's a great work for me it's really nice because family systems a family circle is very similar to a work circle and a work circle is very similar to a family circle so my my interest in systems theory and my inter my experience in systems theory it really allows me to kind of quickly see what might be going on um, and how to support a family as they decide where they want to go so they can kind of get out of some patterns that maybe mm -hmm. aren't so helpful for them very good yeah, yeah. thanks no i'm fi i'm Personally very fascinated. <laughs> we gotta talk. It's a very long answer. And I had an art background in college, so throughout my work, I, working with creative businesses and working um, with children, it's been a really natural fit as well. Although some kids don't enjoy art or art don't find themselves um, interested that way, so I, you know, you don't have to work in that in that way when you come to see me. So it sounds like you have many different approaches in your work. Yeah. You want to talk a little bit about it's the multiple? sure. Yeah. So um, you know, some kids really prefer to just talk, and adults too, and, <clears throat> but um, I offer up some experiential ex um, ways to kind of get to some things, to articulate some, articulate some things, and uh, it would include um, anything from looking at um, images and selecting images that, are, that, are, that remind you of parts of yourself that can, that can dialogue to giving families um, really creative ways to look at what's at the root, or what pattern happens for them that, that that keeps them stuck and um, the feedback I get from clients is that it moves them very quickly and very deeply because the integration happens um, while we're working and it's creative and it, and it expands um, like with gifted you know, with gifted um, individuals we have so much complexity to um, well with all humans there's so much rich beautiful complexity and giving people a chance to use images no matter how many images to kind of sort out what the interplay is in their psyche is, is, is such quick but deep work versus spending hour after hour talking and talking. It kind of moves us out of a bit out of our heads and into our hearts mm -hmm. and into our in our visual fields too to kind of sort things out. If that makes sense. It does. It's. I would love to see. I would love to see that in yeah. action. Maybe we need to do. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. that'd be that'd be really fun. <laughs> Well, let's see, do you have any specialty areas within your gifted <clears throat> counseling services? Um, yes, um, I, uh, well, I, when I first sort of started working with, in my internship, um, I was involved in assisting children who'd been involved in a community crisis, and through that work I ended up, I ended up becoming a bit specialized in grief work for mm -hmm. children, so um, that is one area that Although so sad, um, a time in any human's life, um, I really feel honored to be able to, to uh, hold space for those children and families that are moving through that that kind of work. Um, I also, um, like I said, really enjoy um, kind of the self awareness piece and the self care piece, and helping people cultivate their own tools around that and um, uh, becoming, you know. As much as I enjoy the clients I work with coming to see me, my job is to really help them go back up into the world as, as quickly as possible mm -hmm. with the tools they need. Um, i trying to think what else. Uh, oh, it's funny that I almost forgot this, but I work a lot um, with uh, empathic children and intuitive children, and um, all humans are intuitive and all humans are empathic um, in varying degrees and in varying ways. but. Um, I tend to, the children that show up at my office tend to have sensitivity and perceptiveness in ways where they can experience what other people are feeling and they sometimes pick that up and take it on as their own. Um, sometimes they can see motivation, other people's motivation, or, or sort of dial that in and it trips them up in the world. You know, if they're in a classroom setting, for example, and uh, they're getting in a lot of trouble because they're somehow perceived as being, um, I don't like this word, but disobedient mm -hmm. or um, troublesome or distracting and you know, sitting with them after a while and sorting out that there's a likelihood, um, not, this isn't everyone, but it's just an example, that maybe they're picking up some energy that isn't theirs and it's coming through them and out as their responses to the teacher or their responses in the classroom. and. It's remarkable when kids start to become aware of that and start to develop some tools to um, not take on sort of the pain of the world or the pain of their classroom. Mm -hmm. And it can be something as simple as um, one of their friends or classmates feels 
maybe ashamed because they didn't um, know an answer. A gifted child may, at least the ones I, some of the ones I see, might pick that up and it becomes their own, and then it come, their behavior kind of escalates. Or maybe a t an educator or a teacher is really um, sad or upset about something outside of the classroom, and they come as a professional of the classroom, you know, prepared to teach, but that child can pick that up. Mm -hmm. And it comes out back to the as a reflection of the teacher in anger. and So helping kids kind of get to the bottom of that. Or, and you'll see it in families too, where children will pick up their family members' pain or dilemma, and it makes, makes it their own, and it, it can really bring them into a place that's sometimes sad or frantic, and it's not, it's not there. So helping mm -hmm. them learn to delineate that. Love that work so much. It sounds fascinating. <laughs> and then as an extension of that, and I've had to be very uh, mindful as ha how I approach this, because I never want to project onto a child you know, anything that's any of my belief systems or how I might see the world or matters of, of uh, intuition and empathy. But when we go into the sort of more mystical parts of being human, those um, experiences that are hard to understand sometimes, um, sometimes those children, children who experience those phenomena will bring that to my office and uh, want to not necessarily sort it out, but they're actually usually not quite sure, they just want me to see. And sometimes I'm a bridge back to their parents to help the parents um, <laughs> support their child. And, and most times parents are like, yeah, we knew that already. <laughs> um, but things like um, feeling energy, like walking into a space where there's been a tragedy, for example, or um, having, I think of a really crisp example for you, Children will have precognition, they'll sort of see something before it happens. And sometimes that's in the dream time and sometimes it's not. Mm -hmm. Or um, the one thing I see in my office too, I have to clear the energy. Like a lot of clinicians, we keep the, our spaces really clean energetically. Um, <laughs> I laugh because physically it's not so clean working with kids. <laughs> it's constantly <laughs> popcorn on the floor and such, but um, <laughs> just keeping the, the flow clean because what I've noticed is sometimes kids will come in and um, maybe one child has something very difficult in their life they're working through and then the next client or maybe two clients later in the day um, will somehow pick up on that and start talking about it. Not that they talk about that child, but they talk about some pain in the world that's very related to this specific mm -hmm. thing this child's working on. Or they'll, they'll be drawn to the toys that child played with and they'll pick them up themselves and start talking about um, something that's eerily familiar, similar. So I have to be very pristine in how I, I keep my space clean because these, these gifted kids, um, some of them really can f feel that, pick that mm -hmm. up. So for, for our friends that are watching this that yeah. haven't been exposed to some of these yes. ideas, can you explain a little bit about just how that can occur? Sure. That the transfer of the energy and how that can affect, you know, how oh. a person's <laughs> energy, I mean, I know this is yeah, yeah, no. kind of backwards and maybe not something we can okay. talk about, but it's not okay. everybody is... Um, not everybody gets that part of it. Yeah, and I, thank you for asking. Mm -hmm. This is such an important question, and, and it's something that I muse on quite a bit. And, and um, <laughs> I wish I could give you exactly, you know, I think this is what happens, but um, I spend time thinking about this and musing on this and, and researching what I can. And there's um, a lot of really um, great resource. Uh, it feels to me like we're living in a time where. Um, science and spirit, in many ways, are the same sides, of, or two sides of the same mm -hmm. coin. And um, I just spent time at the Family Gifted Retreat, and we were talk talking with parents about this, about how you have to be so careful when you're working with children who will have these capacities, because um, uh, you want to. This is what I see. We want to be careful not to exploit them in any way, but sort of the other end of that spectrum. You know, become becoming so fascinated scientifically with them that that it somehow shuts that down it, in one, on one end of the spectrum and on the other, um, working to be as grounded as possible as the adults in these children's lives, whether you're their counselor or their parent or their teacher, so that um, we're not projecting onto them some of the more, and I don't want to make science or New Age thought wrong, but some of the New Age thought um, take, tends to go out into ether so quickly around kids, labeling, you know, giving kids names like, um, and I'm not making this wrong, but, Indigo children, or, mm -hmm. or those 
kinds of things we hear through more popular psychology. And I'm not saying that, that either either direction is wrong, but finding that middle ground so that these kids aren't either exploited by an interest in their capacity nor chalked up to some kind of out there energetic yeah, experience. Dismissed, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of in the middle is where I land. I try to land. Mm -hmm. And I try to do the research if I can to find out what's going on in the field. And um, there are people doing the work in scholarly ways. Uh, people, for example, studying children in past lives and doing it in very scholarly ways. Because sometimes that happens. A child will say, you know, I remember being in my family before, but I was a grand my grandparent. Or, you know, that kind of thing uh -huh. will come up. And, I don't know. I don't know what that is. You know, right. I can tell you what I believe from my own life experience, mm -hmm. but it would be unfair and pretty uncool to, to project that onto a child, so I right. just hold space. But it's such a great question. But I feel like right now we live in a time where some of those questions are getting um, focus. Or, or, well, we're actually asking the question. We're actually <laughs> asking the question. I mean, yeah. even 10 years ago, were we mm -hmm. asking the questions? Yeah. I'm not sure that we were. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, great. It, yes, I, I'm not sure either. And you know, I've taken t uh, teenagers to meet with, um, set up like independent coursework for teenagers who wanted to understand some of these matters. And we've met with people like quantum physicists, for example, um, who have some keys, I think, to the answer mm -hmm. you know, or in their experience and their their life's work. And uh, people who do like um, like osteopaths. You know, they're, met, they're Western trained medical doctors, but they work with, and this, I don't know if they would explain it this way, but my understanding is they work with a bit of intelligence that's within the body, for example. Yeah, like a naturopath as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. So how, how does that interface, you know? To, and um, there's people out there who talk about, you know, the heart and the, the neuroscience of the heart and how the heart is, is just as um, intelligent as the brain and how they interface and how they work together. And how does that, how does that play into energy in a field in my office. Mm -hmm. yeah. These things are really interesting to me. Yeah, so <laughs> I, spent, I spend time using it on things and trying to find new ways to do things. And then I, I also feel like neuroscience, we've gotten to the point where there's been this beautiful bridge between um, understanding the brain and sort of calming and creating happiness for ourselves, for example, um, through meditation. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of really fun things that are available right now now to us humans here on the planet that we can, we can look into. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. So tell me, your, your work is inspirational, but what inspires you in your work? Oh, um, I've had, oh, thanks for asking that, um, I've had really good mentors and people who've been open-minded to the things that are of interest to me and um, been reflective points, places where I can check in and say, this is what I'm noticing, this is what I'm learning about. and. Theorists like Alfie Cohn, I don't know if you guys know him, but you know he he wrote a beautiful book called Punished by Reward. It's actually not that beautiful. It's hard to read because it's a great book, but it's research about um, being a society that's been based on a behavioral model, mm -hmm. and, and he extrapolated that out, research out to a parenting model called unconditional parenting. And just knowing there's people like that out there who are trying to help us all move in a direction that's more, um, in my opinion, more humanistic. And um, what else inspires me? Uh, well, the the um, opportunity to offer some relief to people mm -hmm. who experience the world, all humans, but particularly the gifted population who are intense and percep perceptive and um, grow up maybe feeling like there isn't a place for them or they don't understand why they're not fitting and being able to open those doors mm -hmm. and help them. And it feels to me like everybody I, I get to uh, help informs who's coming behind them. Like I get uh, answers from them and keys from them that help the next sort of cohort age-wise and group that comes through. Abs no, I could see how that would be. Yeah, yeah I could see how that would yeah. be. So how do you wish to contribute to the future well-being of gifted children? Uh, That's our last question. Okay. And then you're off the ground. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, will you ask it again? How do Absolutely. I wish to how do you want to um, contribute to the future well-being of gifted children? Or if there's something else you want to talk yeah. about instead of that, that's fine too. No, that's great. Um, the two ways that right now feel the most resonant for me and the most 
the most potent and where I'm, where I'm swimming, where I'm living, are one, helping schools and the world be more ready, more prepared to support them and support the whole, I use this word, this phrase a lot, but sort of the whole child versus um, just the intellect. Mm -hmm. um, and I know schools are tasked with so much right now, but um, really finding ways to um, improve those nests, those educational nests for children. And um, secondarily, I, I, feel, I feel honored and proud to be part of the wave that's stepping forward to say, let's also pay attention to some of the inner world of the child, particularly the intuition, um, the empathic world of the child, so that we can do what we can to support them. And I think, I know, because of their sensitivities, um, they're picking up on what's hard for all humans. Anyways. Oh, I see what you're saying. And yeah. um, you know, they're not that they're ahead, but they're like again feeling the pain of the world. And I feel like as we become more honoring of our own empathy as, as gifted um, people, will help others, the rest of um, ch children and, and systems understand that empathy and, and the importance of honoring it as well. And and there's a part of me sometimes that feels gifted um, people hold on to their sense of self, um, like hold on to these pieces, they don't let them go maybe as easily um, because they're in so intense and because they felt so acutely. And if, if, if that helps inform how other children and other people in the world can hold on to their empathy and honor it, I, I would be honored to be part of that. You are doing <laughs> wonderful work in our field, and I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me and um, to the people out there that are going to see this video at some point. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Kim. Thank you so much. You're and welcome. thanks to the Gifted Development Center for putting together this um, project. Yes, we're excited. <laughs> thank you so much. You're welcome.